Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is the Standing Committee on Health, uh, and I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Gordon Wilson. I'll be your chair. Today, we'll be hearing from witnesses from the Nova Scotia Health Authority, Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal, and Department of Health and Wellness regarding the Cape Britain health care redevelopment. I just want to first off remind everybody about their cell phones, to have them please off or on vibrate. And I'd like to start by asking the committee members to introduce themselves, starting with Ms. Martin. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming. Tammy Martin, MLA for Cape Breton Centre. Good morning, everyone. Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Uh, good morning. Eddie Orrell, MLA Northside Westmount. Welcome. Good morning. You look very official over there. Powerful. My name is Carla McFarlane. I'm the MLA for Pictou West and the PC Health Critic. Good morning. I'm MLA Suzanne Lonis Croft, Lunenburg. Good morning and welcome. Derek Mumberkett, the MLA for Sydney Whitney Pier. Good morning. Jeff McClellan, MLA for Glace Bay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Rafa Di Costanzo, Clayton Park West. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Now I'll ask our witnesses to introduce themselves and uh, have any opening remarks that they might have, starting with Mr. O'Connor. Good morning, I'm John O'Connor. I work for the Department of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal. I'm the Executive Director of Major Infrastructure Projects. Paul LaFleche, Deputy Minister of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal, and I think we'll go through the witnesses and then I'll give the remarks. Good morning, it's good to be back. Denise Perrette, Deputy Minister of Health and Wellness. Carrie McLean, I'm a Special Advisor of Strategic Health Initiatives with the Department of Health and Wellness. Hi, good morning. I'm Mark Lacoud. I'm the Senior Director for the Cape Breton Redevelopment Project. Uh, Kevin Orrell, I'm the Senior uh, Medical Director for the uh, CBRM Healthcare Redevelopment Project. Good morning. I'm Paula Bond. I'm Vice President of Clinical Infrastructure for Nova Scotia Health Authority and Nova Scotia Lands. Uh, good morning. Brett McDougall, Executive Director of Operations, uh, Eastern Zone, Nova Scotia Health Authority. Good morning, uh, Mickey Day, uh, Clinical Director with responsibilities for North Sydney and Waterford with the Cape Breton Redevelopment Project. Good morning, my name is Brian Darrell and I'm with TIR. Good morning, my name is Gerard Jessum, I'm the Executive Director of Building Project Services with TIR. Good morning, I'm Brian Ward, Director of Major Infrastructure with TIR. So we'll have opening remarks, I believe, from Mr. LaFleche starting. So thank you very much for inviting us here today. Uh, I just want to put, uh, I have a very short uh, speech here today, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Oral. Um, I want to put in context the people over here. I realize it's a very large number, but this is a very important project. It's the largest public project that we can uh, find that has ever been implemented in Cape Breton, and we're very proud to work on it. I think everyone here uh, views it as a privilege to be part of this team. So I'll just point out that uh, we have a, a division in Nova Scotia Lands which is set up to do health infrastructure, and several of the people here either work for or seconded to that division. Uh, John uh, heads the uh, uh, design and construction side of that division, and Paula Bond at the far end is the vice president of the clinical side of that division. And uh, working for uh, Paula, you have Mickey Day in the back row, Mark LeCouter, and many other employees who are, who are not here or working on the project. And uh, working uh, for John, you have uh, uh, Brian Ward, who's uh, actually the director of the Cape Breton Project, and others too uh, who are not here today. Brian Darrell is our director of health infrastructure generally, and he's here today because um, there are lines that are blurred, and some of the projects we're doing in Cape Breton on the health side uh, may not be perceived to be part of the major capital project we're discussing here today. Uh, but there might be questions on them, and uh, Brian is also familiar with the long-term care facility. So he's here today, and uh, Brett is uh, an NSHA uh, uh, leader, the leader for the NSHA in the, in the Cape Breton region. So beside me is also two officials from the Department of Health, Kerry Morash, who specifically designed, uh, assigned to be the liaison with us uh, from the Department of Health and uh, Wellness, for the uh, Cape Breton project, and of course the deputy who I think, uh, she tells me this is the Guinness Book of Record appearance 11 times. I'm proud to say we probably have the Guinness Book of Record attendance appearance too here today. Um, so with that, I'll turn over the uh, table to Dr. Kevin Orell, who is the clinical leader 
uh, 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 of the project uh, in Cape Breton. Thank you. Dr. Oro. Good morning. On behalf of our CBRM Healthcare Redevelopment Project team, I would like to thank the committee for having us today. Uh, I was born, raised, and educated in North Sydney, and my passion for this project comes from my 30-year career as an orthopedic surgeon in Cape Breton. I have witnessed and I've been involved in many of the changes that have occurred in healthcare during that time. As the senior medical director, I co-lead the project with our senior clinical director, Mark LeCouter, and two other members of our team are here today. The clinical director for North Sydney and New Waterford, Mickey Day, and our senior director of operations for the Eastern Zone, Brett McDougall. Uh, there are a number of other uh, local leaders uh, who represent uh, our senior uh, leadership team and they are working uh, hard to ensure this project uh, continues. Uh, in keeping with the healthcare strategy that the Nova Scotia government and the Department of Health and Wellness and the NSHA have set in place, we understand the need for an update in the way healthcare is delivered in Cape Breton. This is designed to meet the needs of changing population health, human resources, aging infrastructure, and access to quality services and improved health outcome, which is most important. Physicians and clinical leads of many specialties in family practice are in place to represent uh, the Cape Breton uh, healthcare team. And we have representation from Sydney, North Sydney, New Waterford, and Glace Bay. Our team has been working with frontline workers, nurses, doctors, members of the community to proceed with this project. And we recognize the advantages of this for improved patient experience by enhancing consistency of care and coordinating care and access to service to enhance and increase primary health care, to provide more patient-centered health model to help patients navigate the system, to increase the use of telemedicine and other technologies, to improve our ability to teach for community members, families, medical learners, medical residents, and members of the allied health and nursing professions that now have students in Cape Breton and at our university. There will be an increased number of long-term care beds which will improve flow through the healthcare system. We have state-of-the-art facilities to help attract and retain physicians and other allied care professionals. And this is a very significant opportunity to leave a legacy and an exemplary healthcare system that will meet the needs for the future. Since the announcement was made last June, there have been hundreds of meetings with physicians, staff, community health boards, foundations, advocacy groups, service clubs, the business community, opposition members, and community interest groups as we plan for the uh, change and alteration and adjustment of services to meet the needs of our community. We're in the process now of recruiting patient and family volunteer advisors who will help us with the next stage of the design for this new system. We welcome their participation as they represent their patients, families, and other aspects of the community in which they live. So we look forward to the future planning. We look forward to the changes that will help us to deliver better care. And we look forward to the education of our community members uh, so they'll understand the full uh, aspect and scope of this project. Thank you. Thank you very, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much for your opening remarks. Just to start with, I will attempt to, for those of you that are here, uh, if anybody does feel that they have something to add to the question, I'll try and keep eye contact with you. If you just give me a quick little nod, if you feel that you have something to add to that, if that's okay with everybody here. And we'll start off with the, uh, and that's for Hansard also, I need to recognize everybody there. They're not used to having 12 people um, flicking mics on quickly. So uh, we'll start with the Progressive Conservatives for 20 minutes. Uh, Ms. McFarlane. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, welcome. This is a very exciting project. It is a good news story, and um, it's, it's definitely needed. And there's, uh, it's a huge project. 
and there are a lot of questions. I was amazed in the last month or so just the number of emails that have come to me as the health critic for the PC party and uh, a lot of ideas, a lot of solutions, but most importantly, a lot of questions and they're definitely validated questions. So I would start with Dr. Oral. In your opening remarks, you had mentioned that the consistency of care, which brings me to the question um, of human resources. And I'm wondering, was there a human uh, resource assessment conducted with respect to the overall development um, in moving forward. Dr. Orr. It's, uh, it's been long recognized uh, that, you know, we are under uh, a great deal of stress in terms of meeting the needs of the various specialties, uh, meeting the needs of uh, the allied health professions. Um, I joined the project this January. Prior to that, I'm, I'm on the understanding that there has been some assessment of that but I have no formal um, report of any uh, uh, human resource uh, issues. Um, we, as clinicians, know how difficult it is to get um, many things uh, done in our hospital with uh, physiotherapy, for example, with uh, specialized nursing, with some of the clinic uh, um, uh, uh, care that's given. And uh, we've witnessed uh, the, um, the stress on the system. Uh, organization of this, bringing it into a consistent uh, um, center uh, and having uh, people that are able to concentrate in one area will certainly improve flow. Removing it from some of the places where it's currently located in the hospital will help that as well. And uh, this uh, uh, project will help to redesign where the care takes place and uh, how um, uh, consistently patients can access it. The, uh, the other part of that is knowing exactly where the care will be. So for example, if you take the emergency department, which is highly discussed, we have three emer four emergency departments within 30 miles. We have three that are working at less than their capacity, they're closed 70% of the time. So there's certainly um, an inability of people to recognize exactly where they should go in the event of some type of emergency room uh, requirement. And uh, consolidating that and uh, having people informed about that will make a big, big difference. Ms. McFarland. So there has been, just to clarify, so there has been no written uh, human resource assessment in projecting what the needs of doctors, nurses, allied healthcare professionals will need in moving forward with this project. And I see Mr. Yeah, I'm gonna refer that oh. to Mickey, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mr. Day. Yes. Um, Thank you. Um, so as we moved, par moved along with this project, with the functional pr programming process um, after the announcement last June, one of the things that we've done in the functional programming is that we worked with our clinical leaders and all the different services as we programmed and moved forward. And so we're developing the new clinical spaces, but they're looking at the operational side of things and how they can operationalize that down the road. So as we say, we're going to increase renal dialysis on the north side. Um, moving forward in a new facility, the actual department of, of uh, dialysis is looking at that and how they're going to how they're going to operationalize that. So, what staff and resources do they need, and how they recruit those and move those forward. So, there is a there is a process for the HR side of things as we move forward to make sure that we can operationalize the new um, community health centers and the new departments as we move them forward and redesign them for the future. Ms. McFarland. So we realize that recruitment and retention is um, challenging um, as it is right now. So yep. is there a new plan that's going to be injected in order to ensure that there will be um, <coughs> enough, um, you know, allied healthcare professionals uh, to fill these vacancies? Right now we have close to, I think, 250 openings right now in Nova Scotia for nurses. So w what, you know, is there anything that you can provide today to reaffirm that there is a functional plan in place for recruitment and retainment? So we are continuing to move forward. So as I said, we, we hire, you know, 
numbers of nurses every year because we put a plan together every year as our projection of what we need every year and we put that recruitment request forward and we recruit as many nurses as we can hire pretty much every year within our eastern zone to try and fill the vacancies that we have. We also continue to recruit um, on an ongoing basis throughout the year to try and fill those vacancies. There are, there are um, deficiencies in certain departments but we continue to um, come up with ideas and try and move things forward to try and fill those vacancies as best we can. Ms. McFarland. Is one of those ideas, uh, I think it would be a great idea to have some system in place for exit interviews. Um, we're seeing such a large turnover of healthcare professionals and one of the uh, feedbacks that I'm receiving is that there's no uh, exit interview. Now I understand they can have an exit interview, but there's no actual system in place or anything that's set for um, healthcare professionals to understand that they can have these ex exit interviews. And I think that that is one of our first steps in, you know, trying to identify um, with those that are exiting, you know, what was good while they were mm -hmm. here, uh, what do they believe um, can be improved upon, and what is the real reason why they're exiting. I'm not sure who can answer this question, but I'm wondering if perhaps there is something in place to address that issue so that in going forward in this five-year um, project, um, we will know better and have better uh, systems in place for recruiting and retaining. Yeah, and so I'm gonna to refer to Brett. Brett's our operations our executive director and I'll let Brett handle that one. Mr. McDougall. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, I, and it's an important one. It varies between uh, department to department and service and program, whether or not we do an exit interview on every person that, that leaves the organization. So if we have uh, you know, a department that's in good standing in relation to its turnover and uh, it, it's, it's healthy in, the, in relation to its workplace and, and not much uh, in relation to recruitment and tension, we, we don't really go in to do an a exit interview in that, that particular program or service or department. However, if we do have and, and know about departments that where there are uh, a fair amount of turnover in relation to staff turnover, we do target those departments with uh, human, human relations and uh, begin to do exit interviews to see, to your point, uh, what are the specifics around why there is so much turnover in those departments. And then we look to develop plans for each individual department um, in relation to maybe it's a, you know, the emergency department per se or it's a specialty service and we have to incorporate uh, and change the way the education program is delivered for that service and or what additional supports we put in place for those programs and services. So it's not a cookie cutter approach for the entire organization uh, and or each region. It, it's really dependent on the, the program and, and specific departments. So you could have an emergency department in uh, St. Martha's and Anaganish, for instance, in the Eastern Zone where there's very little turnover um, as opposed to say the Cape Breton Regional where there had been uh, some turnover in the past and we have to dive deeper into why there is uh, a turnover in relation to that department. Ms. McFarland. So continuing on this, so actually uh, St. Martha's I believe have lost 10 specialists just in the last year and of course we know um, the numbers of individuals that have left um, hospitals in Cape Breton. I'm just wondering, so is there any way that I'm able to find out the number of individuals that actually had exit interviews and is that information um, available for us to, so that we can read as well and understand why they're exiting? So Mr. Some, yes, oh, pardon me. So some of the uh, references I was making was in relation to uh, nursing specifically. Okay. So if we get into the medical uh, medical uh, turnover in relation to uh, staff, um, I don't believe we've done a great deal of uh, exit interviews in the past. I know that there's some effort put towards um, that uh, currently. I know Dr. Miller, who's the interim medical uh, executive director for medicine. Um, is uh, working with HR in relation to uh, those physicians who are requesting uh, exit interviews. Um, to my knowledge, I don't believe that we do an exit interview on every person. Uh, perhaps that's an opportunity to improve in the future. I do know that uh, th those that have requested uh, exit interviews have either had an interview or there's one in the queue to, uh, to proceed with an interview based on third-party interview. Ms. Bond, I believe, has... Uh... Ms. Bond. Thank you. Um, I'd just also like to add that uh, we are certainly understanding that there are certain uh, areas, as Brett just uh, mentioned, that are more hard to fill. We know that we have overcapacity issues in the system. Um, 
uh, particularly in emergency departments, uh, critical care. We are working with our education um, within Nova Scotia Health Authority as well as our community partners uh, to look at how we can improve on orientations uh, to help retain the new nurses. We have just hired this spring 250 new grads and we're looking at hiring up to 400 new grads this year, uh, understanding we also need to put in supports around new graduates that are going into specialized areas. That's one of the areas that has been recognized as an area that we can improve on. And Dr. Oral, did you indicate? Just a, a, a comment about the exit interviews. They've been done for many of the people that have come to look at jobs in the medical professions. And a great deal of what they had to say had to do with facilities and services and, and collaboration, all of which can be addressed through this redevelopment project. Ms. McFarland. Thank you so much. Uh, so how so? How can it be um, addressed through this development? Dr. Bowen. Dr. Bowen. No, I'm sorry, Dr. Oral. Uh, for example, the, we had uh, two geriatricians that uh, came and uh, we were quite interested in why they took jobs in New Brunswick. And it largely had to do with the facilities with which they would have to work uh, as they currently exist and what they were offered in New Brunswick. If we had what we foresee as being a, um, a healthcare centre that meets those kinds of needs, they would have been much more interested in Nova Scotia. And we believe we can do that in these new healthcare centres. Ms. McFarlane. So knowing that doctors in Nova Scotia are the lowest paid across this country, do you believe that has any influence on why we're unable to recruit and retain? Dr. Oral. Well, I, I really, the, the issue of remuneration is, is outside my mandate. I mean, many uh, people choose to work in Nova Scotia because this is where they would like to live and uh, <clears throat> accept the fact uh, that they are not going to be compensated like they are in other provinces. And I'm a classic example. I've spent 30 years doing orthopedics, knowing full well that my colleagues in all the parts of the country and in other parts of North America are being paid much more. So people come for different reasons, and I don't think uh, the remuneration of service is, is, is the only reason that people decline. Ms. McFarlane. Thank you, and, and I would agree. And thank you for your dedication and service to our province. We, we do appreciate it. Uh, you mentioned earlier about having community advisors. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. Um, have they been chosen yet? How will they be chosen? Um, and what role will they actually play in this redevelopment? Mr. Day. Hi, yes. Um, so the patient advisories, advisors that we're looking for um, to be part of the redevelopment, we're looking to um, have members from each community that will be part of the redevelopment. So we're looking at having two members from Glace Bay, two members from the Waterford, two members from North Sydney, and two, num two members from Sydney. So there was a posting put out for an expression of interest that was put out, um, and we did have uh, applicants that um, submitted to that. So we've gone through those and we're actually conducting interviews currently. Um, so we started conducting some interviews last week and we'll continue to do that. Um, we're holding some interviews just to make sure, um, you know, people are interested for the right reasons. And because, you know, at the end of the day, this project is about improving health care down the road for 10, 15, 20 years. So we want to make sure that people have the right intentions as to why they want to be a patient advisor. And um, so we're gonna, hopefully going to get those eight together um, and then we'll come, come, come to them. Uh, review the project as it is and where we are based on the functional plans moving forward and get their input because we want people who have real patient experiences, have used the health system, are members of the community, have children in the community and re can really give us the outside opinion and the outside ideas to make sure that we're not missing anything as we go forward because we really want to make sure that we are truly inclusive and in providing holistic health care at the end of the day. So we want to make sure we get all their opinions so that we can try and incorporate that into the plans going forward. Ms. McFarland. Thank you. And just to confirm, will these be volunteer positions? Yes, uh, they will. Positions? Yeah, volunteer positions. Okay, thank you. I'd like to move on to um, questions around the capital plan expenditures. Uh, I guess the big question for me would be, what is the risk of not building it in the sense of um, what specific assessment would have been um, conducted to evaluate the risks associated with the redevelopment plan? And I'm not sure who I should direct the question to. Mr. Ward. Yes, hello. Um, so we did we did a we did a 
an evaluation on the four facilities that are on the redevelopment project. Um, and with the, um, the north side and the uh, <clears throat> new Waterford facility, because of the aging infrastructure there, in order for us to bring those, those uh, facilities up to what we would consider a, a standard, today's standard, it would have cost a significant amount of money. The biggest thing that we ran into in these facilities, the low floor to ceiling heights. So it would have been incredibly uh, difficult to try and introduce air conditioning, um, to try and update some of the other services within the facility. So as we went through that project, knowing that renovations are extremely expensive and um, <clears throat> are very trying on, on staff and patients, mm -hmm. that's when we uh, started to look at the new community health centers. Ms. McFarland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Are we able to have access to that uh, report? As, uh, who gets to look at that Mr. assessment? Ward. Yes, I think we can make that available. It was, um, for some reason, I thought it was already made available. Okay, great. I think Mr. LaFleche. I think it was available online and then somehow it got offline. So we'll look into what happened there. Thank but I, I believe it was available at one time. Ms. McFarland. So within that assessment, would it include um, what the risk would be in closing the existing facilities, such as um, um, Northside General? Would it include you know, what the risk would be in closing that? Mr. Ward. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not certain which types of risk you mean, but uh, as we go through with the replacement of those two facilities, the north side and the new Waterford, uh, the facilities will remain open until the new facilities are built. Ms. McFarland. And are the decisions final on where they're actually being built, the locations of them? Mr. Ward. We're, we're going to put the new facilities in, in North Sydney and New Waterford back within those communities, yes. Ms. McFarland. The actual locations, though, are, uh, is the land already owned by the province? No, Mr. we're doing... Ward. Oh, sorry. We're, we're, we're going to go through a process very similar to what we did with the QE2 when we were looking for the Bears Lake site. So we're looking at a multiple of locations within the communities to try and identify where would be the best place to, to uh, place the facilities. Mr. LaFleche. You don't have to push the button. If you push it, you turn it off. Mr. LaFleche. I have button pushing issues. I like to push buttons. Yeah. That's why they don't have the nuclear launch facility in my office. <laughs> they put it in that other guy's office down in Washington. Right. Um, anyway, um, yeah, we, we, we should have some news, I think, in the near future on location. So we have a team uh, that's working with uh, Brian and... Uh, uh, also uh, liaising with the clinical side, uh, which is looking at land acquisition. So the specific question of whether it's provincial land or not is not known yet. We do have provincial options in both those communities. We also have private options and we have municipal options in both those communities. And I think it's no secret that we have been exploring in North Sydney uh, at least one case, a municipal option. I say that because I think it's been publicly revealed at council. So those are the options we have. They're near the current facilities. Uh, they're not distant from them. And hopefully we will finalize some options in the near future. They have to be of sufficient size and scale to handle uh, all of what we're talking about, which in some cases may be larger than in the past. So we have to look at that. Thank you. Ms. McFarland. Thank you. I'm just curious, who's on that team and how was that team determined? Mr. LaFleche. Do not touch the button, okay. <laughs> uh, Brian, do you want to talk about that? Mr. Ward. So the team, uh, the team is mainly made up of the, the folks on the, on the redevelopment uh, project. So the folks at TIR are leading where it's a land item. And um, Mark and his team are, of course, giving us some inputs. And uh, with their knowledge of the area, uh, we do have a, a local uh, staff member, uh, Roy McDonald, that is in, uh, in Sydney office, who's been leading that for us. Ms. McFarland, one minute. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. So currently, how many full-time employees are um, with the Health Infrastructure Division of Nova Scotia Lands? Mr. Ward. It, or Mr. Flesh. Probably, uh, but John is best to speak to that. We'll have the full answer at 3 o'clock today when we present the org chart. 
to our committee of deputies and, and CEO of the Health Authority. But John, do you have a Mr. quick preview of that? Yeah, I can uh, give some information on that. The Division of Nova Scotia Lands is set up uh, as a, a structure to oversee the work of the QE2 project and the Cape Breton project, but the number of positions in under Nova Scotia lands are somewhat limited at this point because it's just being set up the structure. A lot of the people working on the project currently, there's up about 80 or 90 people in total between the QE2 project and the Cape Breton uh, projects. And all of those folks are not employees of Nova Scotia lands. Uh, so there, are, there are currently employees of the Health Authority or TIR or Department of Health. And, uh, but we're consolidating the resources and the monies under Nova Scotia lands. Order. Time has expired for the Conservative Party. We'll now turn to the NDP. Ms. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, th I thank again the committee for being here. Such a large committee, so we'll try to get through it as quickly as we can. So first, a few opening comments about concerns that have been brought to me um, at, about the, the uh, redevelopment project in Cape Breton. While the announcements for the cancer centre and the revitalization of the emergency room at the regional hospital are wonderful announcements, they still pose some concerns to those residents in New Waterford and North Sydney. Um, as aside from that, we know that kids are going to Halifax for mental health treatment. There's 363 days for the first appointment for an adult to receive mental health treatment. People in Cape Breton are waiting months for, health, for home care. Spouses are being separated from New Waterford to Tatamagush, being placed in long-term care facilities. In Cape Breton, we know that our patients are dying at a higher rate than anywhere else in the province. We also know that doctors in CBRM are retiring or leaving, and we know that last week, or over the last couple of weeks, 20 have resigned. We also know that the regional hospital emergency department is already overloaded, so we're going to add 20 more thousand people to that. We also know that la over the last week or so that there was not one empty bed in the emergency room at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. Finally, we also know that um, we had the benefit of having EHS here at our last meeting, and when I asked uh, Terry what happens when there's no ambulance available, and I call an ambulance for a loved one in New Waterford, and the ambulance is coming from Bedecker and to Ganesh, what happens? His answer was, and it's enhanced, that my family member would be non-living by the time that the ambulance got there. And these are the concerns that this redevelopment project has, because while it's a wonderful idea, people want to know what they do today. People want to know how they get medical services today, because in two or three or five years, it is a wonderful plan, but people are dying today. So having said that, um, did the minister go over the bulk of the announcement with the um, cancer? and emergency room expansion, or is there more information to come from that? I'm not sure who that question is directed to. Whoever wants to take who it. Who would like to answer it? Doc, Mr. LaFleche. I'm going to touch that damn button. <laughs> uh, uh, so the question, I think, was, did the minister release all of the information, or is there more to come? Well, uh, obviously, the, the announcement was a high-level announcement, generally describing where we are. There's a lot of detail which will come through a functional uh, planning process. And uh, maybe I could ask um, someone back there, is that you, Brian, to describe the, that process? And maybe Dr. Orell could talk about his side of the process so you understand what flows down at a detail level from those higher-level announcements. Mr. Ward. So following the announcements and during the announcements, so we were doing a, the healthcare staff were doing the functional programming with, uh, with our uh, casein architecture and Agnum Peckham. And then as we started to work out through the, uh, <clears throat> through the process, it came evident that the program that was required at the regional um, for the emergency department, uh, the space requirements certainly weren't uh, sufficient. So we were able to, uh, uh, we went into government with a proposal to provide a a new emergency department so that we wouldn't interfere with the existing emergency department. 
and uh, also the same with the cancer care. We started to look at cancer care, and uh, as we were looking at cancer care, we realized that there was a, a large addition and a, and a significant renovation within the existing cancer care. So it's very difficult to renovate a space and to still provide the health care needs of the, of the people in, in the Cape Breton region. So the decision was also made to ask government to provide a new uh, cancer centre. And the same with the uh, critical care. We started to look at critical care. How can we renovate critical care when we're actually using it? And as you all know, the uh, hospitals are running at 100%. So the, uh, so the decision to, uh, the, the team decision to, to provide the government with an option of uh, a new cancer care, a new emergency department, and new critical care was brought into government. And we had approval prior to the uh, minister making that announcement. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Oral. Uh, health care is enormously complicated, and um, I feel the mandate for the redevelopment project has to be well defined, or we will get bogged down in all of the day-to-day -day things that happen. All of the things that have been pointed out um, uh, by Ms. Martin are certainly well known to us, and they have affected uh, us in the way that we are functionally planning for the future. But our project is for future care delivery, and we cannot address all of the issues that currently exist because we wouldn't get our mandate accomplished. Um, having said that, uh, many of the things that uh, uh, have been pointed out are going to be uh, much, much um, easier to deal with in a redesigned healthcare system that we're planning. Thank you. Ms. Mart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And with all due respect, um, I, I doubt it would be easier to deal with people dying today in a, in a redesigned healthcare system. Um, my concern, as is with most of Cape Breton, is what's going on today. Um, so if I could just go back to the building um, specifics. So I guess what I was trying to get at, have all of the announcements regarding the redevelopment of the regional hospital been announced? Mr. LaFleche. Yeah. Okay, so there are other things happening in the regional hospital. Obviously, we're vacating the existing ICU, CCU mm -hmm. space. We're vacating some of the ER way down the road when we get the new facility built. And so there will be things that go into those spaces. But I think, again, uh, and that will be announced in due course. We haven't done the planning, all the planning for that. So maybe, Brian, you can just talk about where we are in the planning for all of that other stuff going into the regional. Mr. Ward. So following with the announcement, uh, with the most recent announcement, we're starting now to look at the facility. So part of the master planning strategy is to start look at the existing facility. So look at the existing Glace Bay Hospital, look at the existing regional hospital. Um, start to look at what services are provided to, well, we have been looking at what services are provided in North Sydney and New Waterford. And then we're trying to bring them back into the uh, regional facility. So the vacancies that will finally occur as we open up the new emergency cancer care, critical care, then what we'll be doing is we'll be starting to uh, renovate within the existing hospital, provide more room for the services that require more room that will be in that hospital, and also any of the other services that will be brought in from North Sydney or from uh, New Waterford. Ms. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is there a time frame assigned to that or, or that you could list? Mr. Ward. Yeah, we're looking at the full master plan to be done uh, late August, early September. Uh, the master programming is, uh, is, is being finalized this month, and uh, the programs themselves have been uh, pretty much finalized this month awesome. also. Ms. Martin. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to talk about inpatient beds now, and we recently talked about this in, S in budget estimates. So right now, um, adding the intensive care or the critical care or intermediate care beds um, to the existing 24. So that will bring us at 36. Right now, there's 21 inpatient beds in New Waterford and 45 in North Sydney. So that's a total of 60, 65. So losing those beds in those two inpatient hospitals, those acute care beds, will be down one quarter of the total patients in CBRM. The 12 new beds that have been announced recently are not enough to mitigate that loss. The minister has said, though, in estimates, that we shouldn't assume that these beds will disappear, that the functional processing hasn't been completed. Could somebody please clarify um, 
that we have a glimmer of hope that these 40 some odd beds will remain somewhere and where would that be? Mr. Day. Thank you for the question, Tammy. Um, so based on the functional programming that we're doing, we're looking at all inpatient services that are currently in existence within North City, New Waterford, Glace Bay, the regional hospital, even Harborview, um, which is kind of the, the forgotten entity within the whole mix of the redevelopment. And we're looking at, you know, in the future, we're not gonna have any less beds in, than what we currently have. So how do we redesign the system that we're doing just to make sure that we, because we know the services are gonna change. And we, so we're not losing those 45 beds in North City. So we need to figure out where they're going to go and what mix they're going to be. And maybe they look differently in the, in the level of care that they provide, but how are they going to look? So we're still working on that as part of the functional programming. So hopefully as that moves forward and we get that finalized, we'll be able to give you, you know, a real answer as to where they're going to be and what it's going to look like. Ms. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So specifically, would it be possible that some of those beds would be in the new facilities in New Waterford and North Sydney? as they are now currently in the community. We don't know that yet. We still have to work on that functional programming. So that's that, the inpatient part is still ongoing. We haven't finished that one yet. So as we look at that redesign with our clinical leaders, we're still trying to figure that stuff out. Yeah. Mr. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that answer. I'd like now to talk about long-term care um, and the, the new buildings, the new facilities that will be um, created or, or reconstructed. Um, will the nursing homes be freestanding in the community where they are, where the beds are provided now? And will they be, will they be funded publicly or privately? Mr. LaFleche. Oh, um, they will be in the same community, yes. Uh, the facilities in general will be in the same committee. We talked about that earlier. But in terms of uh, a decision on, uh, uh, you're talking about the, how the building will be funded, not the service. Not the service. Okay. Oh, the service. Yeah, okay. So maybe I'll let Denise answer, because in terms of the building, no decision has been made yet. We're not at that stage. But maybe, Denise, you can talk about the service. Ms. Perrette. So, so we're expanding the long-term care capacity in, in both those communities, new freestand, well, they may not be entirely freestanding, they may be associated with the community health centers that are there. 74 net new beds and it's a publicly funded system. Ms. Martin. Thank you, and publicly run? Ms. Perrette. I'm not, I'm not sure if all those decisions have been made, but I can assure you it's publicly funded. Ms. Martin. So what will be done with the empty hospitals with New Waterford and North Sydney? Mr. LaFleche. Well, we'll add them to the existing stock of empty hospitals we have like Colchester. Um, and that's a bit of a joke, but uh, we, uh, we will have empty hospitals anywhere we build a new facility and don't renovate, just like we have empty schools anywhere we build a new facility and don't renovate. In the case of the hospitals, uh, we'll, we'll have to determine the legal status of those sites, but generally they will, if, if the legal status is that they return to the province, then uh, our land division will take care of the future of them. Ms. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would beg to differ with New Waterford, though, because I believe that New Waterford Hospital is community owned and was community built. Well, as I said, we'll do some legal work on that to see where they go. As in the case of schools, there's always a complicated history. In some cases, we find we think we own a school, but then it was actually owned by another group and then willed to some third group. And so we'll, we'll go through that process. And uh, I assure you that uh, we are not looking to keep uh, facilities that uh, we don't have to keep. Ms. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What sort of considerations are guiding the functional planning team in making these decisions around the, the facilities for long-term care? Mr. LaFleche. Uh, sorry, uh, could you just, just describe a bit more what you mean by that question? Ms. Martin. Well, what's, what's guiding the location, the process, the size, the, the staffing, whether public or private? Oh, very good, okay. So, attached, to, uh, <laughs> attached to the health center or not? Yeah, only a couple of those would be in the field of, of uh, Nova Scotia lands and, and, and transportation infrastructure renewal. So we'll address those and then I'll turn over the, 
some of the questions, some of the part of the question to uh, Denise. Um, in terms of location, our instructions were to put them back in the communities they're in, whether they're exactly on the same site or at a site 500 feet away. A lot of that is determined by uh, the size of the land we need, uh, whether we can easily acquire the land, uh, the access to the land. We have made a decision to uh, co-locate the uh, long-term care facilities uh, with the community health centers. So that right away uh, gives you a certain dimension of, of, of land. Uh, and in doing that, we also have to consider entrances and exits, egress to the sites uh, in terms of transportation. So all of that factors in, which gets us to uh, a smaller set of available land portions in those two communities, we're talking New Waterford and North Sydney, that are possible. So our land division is working uh, with uh, Brian, who is the project director for Cape Breton, uh, to see what is available. And of course, we talk to the clinical people to see if there are any no-goes, whether there are any issues that uh, they have, which uh, again would uh, uh, allow us to constrain to a smaller subset the available land. So we're going through a process like that, and maybe, I don't know, Brian, if you can add to that process. Mr. Ward. Well, I guess, uh, as the deputy mentioned, co-locating co the uh, long-term care and the community health centers onto the same same properties will allow us also to use some of the same resources, possibly uh, one heating plant. Uh, we'll be able to uh, possibly, uh, if there's some sort of an amenity within the community health center where you want to sell sandwiches and, and that sort of thing, you could use the kitchen that's in the long-term care. You also, uh, if you had long-term care uh, patients who needed to uh, have certain types of uh, health care needs, we could we can move them from one facility to the other with a bring in some sort of a patient transfer. So there's a lot of pluses on that side of keeping the two on the same site. So the other parts of, sorry, the, other parts of the question you asked. Mr. LaFleche. How they were going to be, yeah, sorry. The other parts of the question you asked were about how they're going to be operated. Is that right? And then there was another question on. Um, Public. I believe Mr. Day has uh, comments. Okay, yeah, and I'm, so I want to turn it over, yeah. Mr. Day. Yes, thank you. I think um, Brian briefly hinted at it there is there's real benefits to having the long-term care and the community health centers locate, co-located together in, in the same structure. Um, one of the issues you mentioned earlier, Tammy, was about EHS. So as you know, if somebody in a long-term care facility right now becomes ill and they have to be transported to a hospital site, well, that requires an EHS transfer. So co-locating them within the same structure actually provides some benefits mm. and eases some of the strain on EHS because if a person in long-term care becomes ill, they can directly go to an attached community health center, get the lab tests that they needed, get x-rays, those sorts of things, um, which actually provides a, a relief on the system that way. Um, it also has other opportunities where their primary care physician may be co-located in the same structure um, and those sorts of things. So are there all kinds of benefits to co-locating those in the same facility? Ms. Martin. Thank you, thank you for that clarification. So I'd like to talk a bit about staffing concerns and the recent NSGEU survey that, that was uh, discussed last week. 93% of nurses, nurses surveyed say they are being put at risk because they work short. 69 say that they've witnessed a near miss. 92% say their workload has increased. 80% say their employer's decision to change the way they interpret overtime language in their contract has increased their workload. 85% say they work short at least once per week. 77 say their employer's decision to change the way back to the overtime um, has actually increased the time on the unit that they are working short. T only 12% of the respondents said they work they feel safe at work, which is pretty dis disturbing. 84% of respondents say they have phys um, had physical or verbal threats or abuse or violence, and 35% of nurses in asked say they, their injuries over that same period of time that they have sustained during that period. So going forward with the redevelopment, although the crisis is now, um, building this capacity and these new facilities, is the staffing component um, any part of this planning going forward. Mr. McDougall, two minutes. I'm sorry, one minute. No. Uh, 
So I think <clears throat> overall we're taking into consideration health service resourcing for Eastern Zone as it currently stands and allowing the Cape Breton redevelopment planning uh, and when I say planning, the functional planning and then the master programming to help develop uh, the future state in relation to what our resource plans would be. So, so currently we are able to uh, determine the uh, amount of long-term care, or sorry, the LTD, uh, mat leaves, and those types of things that impact our overall um, resources, and we build that into our uh, recruitment strategy for nursing in particular, and uh, that helps articulate to uh, the organization uh, what our needs are you know, each year going forward. Um, so with that, in combination with the service planning for the Cape Breton Redevelopment, we'll be able to develop a, a service planning needs that we can uh, work with government and our education partners to help uh, build the platform for our health services needs in the future. Thank you. Order. Time has expired. We'll now move to the Liberal Party with Mr. Mumberkett for 20 minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, with the committee. Uh, I'll start us off, um, and I want to start off by thanking each and every one of you um, for the work that you've been doing uh, in our community. Uh, this has been a long time coming, I believe, for Cape Breton, and successive governments have, uh, have received reports and studies and recommendations in regards to what we need to do to better support uh, the health care services that we provide. Uh, to uh, to Cape Bretoners and uh, the work that you're doing is is exceptional. So um, I know you don't hear it uh, as often as you should, but I can tell you as a local MLA in the community, people are very positive uh, of the announcements that we've made. People are very positive uh, about the work that you all have done, uh, and uh, I want to thank you for that. So uh, to the local leadership team, Dr. Oral and your and your team, uh, we've known each other a long time, and you've done a tremendous uh, amount of work in our community both as a physician and as a volunteer, so uh, you stepped up again, so thank you, sir, for the work that you're doing along with your team. Um, I'll start my questioning off with, uh, you know, throughout this process, you hear, um, you know, some questions come through about what the consultation has been uh, in the community, and I know that it's been discussed here uh, in various parts of the uh, this proceeding, but uh, and, I, and I open the floor. So, so I, I think it's important for people at uh, the folks at home to know how much consultation actually went into a decision of this magnitude. So, I'll, that's my first question, just to elaborate a bit on the consultation. Dr. Oral, I can. Take oh, I'm it. sorry, Mr. Uh, Lacoutier. Thank you for the question. Uh, we've we've had uh, well over 100 uh, engagement meetings with uh, health boards, uh, special interest groups. Um, uh, Chamber of Commerce, Rotary Clubs, anybody who's anybody who's interested in uh, hearing about a project, and uh, we're more than willing to meet with them. Um, there's over 100, at, and they started right even before I was on the team. Uh, Brett McDougall, executive director, that he met, he's meeting with uh, many interest, special interest groups. Um, it's uh, it's very exciting. It's um, we're getting a lot of great feedback, and it's we've meet, we're meeting in each communities, and uh, certainly we're going back now to look at re regrouping with those groups, to update them on our project, and uh, certainly uh, a lot of great feedback. This is a huge project; it's an, an investment of hundreds of million dollars in our local economy, in our health infrastructure, and along with that, we'll we'll, we'll create a more sustainable, reliable healthcare system. And it's 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 exciting. I've been in the health authority 16 years as a nurse, and I. Um, I was, I was, I'm very excited about the project, and so is our team. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an evolution of the healthcare in Cape Breton, and uh, it's certainly the right thing to do. Yeah, and, 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 and again, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll get used to it. I won't push the buttons, but I'll wait for the <laughs> microphone to come on. Um, now, listen, I appreciate that because uh, for me, we have these conversations on a daily basis in our community, and there was a lot of questions. And and uh, this is uh, the most significant, as, as Mr. Lafush said, the most significant project, public project in the history of Cape Breton. I want to talk a bit about uh, recruitment and, and what the facilities mean. Uh, you know, I've had great conversations with Brad Jacobs and the leadership with the Hospital Foundation in regards to, you know, the role they want to play in the expansion of the cancer center. Um, you know, Dr. Brake, uh, during the announcement, talking about what the critical care unit's going to mean for Cape Breton as it serves the entire island. Um, he calls it, to, when it's done, it will probably be the best uh, we have in the province. So, so these are exciting uh, announcements for, for Sydney specific and for the entire island. But Dr. Earl, back to your doctor recruitment. 
you know, this is a conversation that we've had in the past, and this is a conversation that MLAs have on a daily basis. And we know through some of the statistics uh, that are coming through the NSHA, approximately 13,000 Cape Bretoners have found access to primary care uh, in the last uh, two or three years. Um, we know in some communities now, I was looking at the numbers last night, uh, and uh, we still have some challenges when it comes to, to the access to primary care and some of the services that we provide. We, we know we're also strong in other areas of the island when it comes to uh, to recruitment, uh, specifically up in, in the Shetty Camp areas and whatnot. The numbers are very strong. Um, but I want you to elaborate, uh, uh, Dr. Earl, if you can, on, on what this means uh, to continue that work to to recruit and retain uh, physicians on the island. Dr. Oral. Well, historically, I could go back to 1993 when I was a member of the Regional Services Committee that um, closed the three small hospitals in Sydney and uh, moved to the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. And at that time, we did much of what uh, we we're hoping to do through this redevelopment project. There was a consolidation of care there was um, uh, facilities provided that were very attractive to new graduates and to people that were working in locations that didn't have the same type of uh, uh, work environment. So what we saw at the time the Cape Breton Regional Hospital opened was an influx of people attracted to the facility and attracted to the working conditions. And by that I refer to the fact that instead of having internal medicine specialists who did everything, cardiology, gastroenterology, we then developed a group of people that were most interested in cardiology and could uh, uh, concentrate on that. An infectious disease um, consultant uh, was attracted to the hospital. It was bigger, there were more patients, we could support that kind of a specialty practice. We had other internists with other subspecialty interests come. We had a thoracic surgeon. We had a number of oncologists for uh, medical oncology and radiation oncology who came to the cancer center when it was built. Radiology improved and we began to develop radiologists that were specialized in different types of radiological investigative procedures and interventions. I was one of two orthopedic surgeons uh, who became one of three and now we have five. So there's no question that the um, type of facility that is offered to people looking for work makes a big difference. And I think uh, that this is definitely going to be the case. We're going to recruit people who will be interested in the redesign of a modern healthcare delivery, the benefits of having services in the communities where they're needed. Not everything has to come to the big house. They're going to be able to consolidate their specialty together as a group who practice and, and learn together and cooperate together and share call schedules together. This is very, very attractive to new graduates. The other thing about recruitment, which we often forget, is that if this is sustainable and it is a system that offers everything that we know we will be able to um, create, then we'll be able to retain those people because Cape Breton has seen a lot of doctors come and go. But this type of design will be a retention tool as well. And thirdly, which is not often discussed in terms of recruitment, is that there's been a number of doctors in our local community who have withdrawn for various reasons, sometimes because they're frustrated, burnt out, sometimes because it's objection to something that they don't agree with. We can recruit these people back, and many have already expressed an interest and shared that with us. So we can recruit people that actually still live in our community who are willing again to step up as medical leaders and be involved with this. So from that point of view, I think recruitment is very rich. Mr. Mumberkett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I have one final question before I pass it over to uh, my colleague for the last 10 minutes of this round. Uh, just in regards to, and it was a comment that M Mr. LaFleche said, and it is important, first and foremost, this is about providing the right health care uh, for the island and this redevelopment project uh, is very significant, but it is. It's one of the most significant public projects Cape Breton has ever seen. So I know that a lot of the work is not done yet, but if you want to elaborate uh, on, on, on that, that point that you made earlier on about about uh, you know in your experience when it comes to projects of this magnitude. 
Mr. LaFlush. So there's a lot of capital work that is going to go on in Cape Breton in the future. I mean, we've got some projects that are proposed, but we've got a number that have been announced, and they include this. The Premier put a label of about half a billion dollars on this one. Uh, we, we don't have a definitive uh, figure yet, but it'll be at least that. We, we've got the Community College Project. We've got the second birth in Sydney. We've got the Bayplex under construction now. We've got a number of potential wastewater projects which have to be done before the new environmental rules come in. And we've got a lot of other proposals. So there's a lot of work, capital work, that is going to be done in that area. And um, uh, this is going to cause uh, quite a, 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 if I can use the word, boom in activity. So maybe I'll let uh, Gerard uh, uh, Jessam uh, who's our executive director of project design and construction, but was the uh, regional director for, uh, for the transportation side for many years in Cape Breton, uh, describe uh, what that means and what plans we have to ensure that Cape Bretoners benefit from this activity. Mr. Jessen. Uh, thanks for the question, Minister. Yes, uh, this is a significant project that's being planned right now, plus there's uh, many more significant uh, expenditures planned for Cape Breton. And, and being a Cape Bretoner, I have never seen this amount of investment in the economy in, in Cape Breton, and will definitely have big uh, potential benefits for all Cape Bretoners in the community as well. Uh, we're working on a labour strategy now. Um, like uh, De Deputy uh, LaFleche mentioned, uh, we not only the healthcare projects, we have uh, uh, NSCC Marconi campus relocation. We have three schools uh, that will be built and all this work over the next, probably within the next uh, three to 10 years. So it's a substantial amount of work, but we have to plan it accordingly to make sure we maximize the benefits for Cape Bretoners and Cape Breton itself. Uh, as we all know, the economy is not great in Cape Breton, but I think uh, if planned properly through these uh, public infrastructure investments, we can uh, maximize the benefits uh, and kind of, uh, I think, set the, the train in a different direction. Um, based on, uh, we, we, are, we work, are working on a labour strategy for, uh, for all this work that's upcoming. Um, we're working with the Labour Advanced Education as well as uh, local uh, groups, minority groups, um, uh, MIBO, um, Mi'kmaq Economic Benefits Office and other min minority groups as well to try to strategize in the best way to carry out and complete all this work uh, that we have on, uh, on, on, that we have set to, uh, that we have planned and that's ahead for sure. So it's exciting times for Cape Breton and I, I think if I had a tool belt on, I was working out west, I'd be looking home for work again for sure. Thank you. Mr. McClellan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I uh, appreciate the the, uh, the committee, the team being here today. Um, I'm going to have a, a, a bit of a question that's personal in nature for Dr. Earl, but I just want to do a bit of a, a preamble slash uh, soliloquy first about what this means to me. Um, it's it's an um, enormous sense of pride every time we talk about the Cape Breton redevelopment planned uh, for us, uh, for, for MLA Mombercat and I. Uh, but in fairness, for all MLAs in Cape Breton, uh, this, uh, regardless of the political stripe, because it's been such a long road uh, for health care and, and um, you know, for us, the, the, the opposition MLAs get the questions, but of course, as, as government reps uh, on the island, uh, we get it uh, the most and, and, and the heaviest in terms of intensity. Uh, and it's been a long road and it's been a, a tough challenge. And I think that there was a period where when we're in the transition and we're, we're getting to a place where we would get, uh, you know, some of these projects announced and out the door, um, it seemed as though nothing was happening. And I think that uh, now uh, it's very uh, clear and evident that there's a lot of things happening. Um, uh, Dr. LaFleche, uh, Paul, you, you referenced the uh, half a billion dollars in, in spend. Um, this is an enormous challenge that this is going to, uh, as Mark said as well, reshape uh, the entire landscape of healthcare delivery. Not only in Cape Breton will be the benchmark, uh, but this will transcend uh, to the rest of the province and, and, and in areas uh, where, where infrastructure has to, has to take place. And I think that um, for us, this is something that I 100% stand behind. Uh, this is a legacy personally for me because we're making a difference and we're making the change that's necessary. Uh, so as far as, as uh, being happy and supportive of this, uh, I, I, don't, I don't hear the negative Activity in terms of these, uh, this decision and this half a billion dollars and this uh, massive spend uh, for our four uh, hospital sites that we have. Uh, you know, uh, one of my next questions in the second round is around that short-term piece. I don't think that's lost on anyone that we have to get to that point where the doors are open and there's no doubt about it. Um, <clears throat> but to my question uh, for you, Dr. Earl, as we go forward, I think that, uh, you know, for the, for the 
security and, and sort of um, you know support of uh, Cape Bretoners who are who are focused on what this is going to mean for them and their healthcare delivery. Um, the, the healthcare professionals, the doctors at the forefront, uh, become incredibly important. Uh, so your your face, your reputation, your integrity is of critical uh, importance for Cape Bretoners. Not for us as the government side, not as politicians, uh, as for Cape Bretoners. Um, you have a, a tr tremendous legacy uh, in the community. I know uh, you've got a collection of body parts from the McClellan family between my dad's hips and my shoulders. Uh, so so you've and and uh, cousin Eddie also had some work done as well. Uh, we'll see him soon uh, but uh, but um, dr. Earl in in discussions uh, in this chamber and I'm not this isn't political and I'm not looking to to call anybody out but uh, there was discussions around uh, your your motivation here um, you've been a critic up until two years ago you led a rally that was very critical of our government's decisions and direction and I think look uh, you're you're a person as I always say healthcare professionals they're opinions matter the most. Uh, so if that was your opinion then at this point, at that point, uh, then that, that's reasonable uh, that you would be there. Um, now, in my opinion, biased of course, but you see that this is a real thing and it's going to change uh, healthcare in Cape Breton forever. Um, the insinuation was that um, you went from being a critic to being a champion and that there would be some wonderful position at the end of this this process for you uh, and that um, somehow you're motivated by that uh, as opposed to that you you know, for some reason there's questions around why you would support this plan. Um, we don't, we, we haven't rehearsed this. I don't have any idea how you react to that. Uh, but I, in the, in this world of political discourse, uh, you're going to be the person who is the matters the most in terms of reputation. So I'd like you to address the question was people, doctors and people in the community are asking what has changed for Dr. Oral oral. So I would like to ask you, Dr. Oral, what has changed? Dr. Oral. Thank you. Firstly, I, I believe uh, I had a number of calls uh, concerning that after those remarks were made. And uh, I believe it was um, there was some reference made that I was appointed by the government. And nothing could be further from the truth. I uh, applied for this position when the expression of interest came out. I rehearsed, I planned uh, ahead, um, prepared. It was my first job interview since first year university when I applied to Marine Atlantic to be a ticket clerk. So I, uh, I fully uh, respected the, the process of the competition and uh, was very, I think, very fortunate and very grateful to receive the, the appointment after uh, the, the uh, committee uh, met with a number of other candidates. Um, I think when I go back to, I've been very vocal and I, I consider myself a medical leader in our community. And there were a number of things that were very difficult to understand uh, as a practicing surgeon, as a clinician, and in, in uh, cooperation with my colleagues. My overriding uh, protest, if you will, was that as Cape Bretoners, we didn't have a voice. So I applied for a position where I thought I would have a very significant voice in what was going to change in Cape Breton in terms of healthcare delivery. And that basically corrected my objections. So I, I, I had a voice and I felt that I could uh, significantly contribute and I'm very excited about uh, the uh, contributions so far. There were three aspects to why I was interested in this position. One was from a career point of view. In my early career, I made reference already that I was on the regional service committee that uh, redesigned and um, uh, reorganized services provided at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital when the three smaller hospitals closed. That was early career. In mid-career, I was involved as the only physician uh, with the Department of Health and Wellness um, for the models of care. And that significantly changed care delivery and uh, the uh, way allied health professions uh, uh, interacted uh, with uh, patients, with doctors, with staff. And uh, I consider that a, a midterm interest that I think was very successful. And this now in my senior years is something that I feel uh, I can contribute. As far as an appointment at the end of this, uh, that would be retirement. <laughs> But uh, um, the second thing is, is that we need to change things. When you're involved with the day-to-day -day grassroots activity of looking after patients and interacting with families, you have to recognize that things have to change. And we are not inventing something new, which is 
a misconception by many people who hear about this project. This is worldwide. And uh, many, many countries have enjoyed the success of this kind of redevelopment. Uh, the third thing is that I have children now. I have a son who's a nurse, so two uh, daughters that are studying um, specialties. And perhaps we may make uh, uh, Nova Scotia an attractive place for them to come, and I'm very interested in that as well. Thank you. Uh, 30 seconds. Mr. McClellan. Um, just quickly, uh, maybe this is a yes or no or, or sort of how this works. One of the concerns in the community is that in the transition, particularly for the north side and New Waterford, uh, that there will be a gap where those sites will be closed without the new spots reopening. So can you reopen? So could Mark or, or Paul, can you address that quickly? Mr. LaFleche. Mark. Mr. Mark. Le Couture. Actually, you know, the, our planning and our master planning all involves having other facilities open before any type of uh, decommissioning of any buildings, and uh, absolutely. That, and we do get that. We, we do, we've had that um, comment from a few of our com uh, community meetings, and we assure people that, that is not, that's not the plan. So, okay, thank yeah, you. It's safe. Order. Time's expired. We'll now move to the Progressive Conservative Party. We have 13 minutes for the next round. Mr. Orrell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for appearing for me today. Um, continuing on what uh, Minister McClellan just asked about the closures of the Northside General in the Waterford while the build is taking place. Uh, my opinion is they're being kept open because they're needed. Um, there is not enough capacity at the regional hospital now to handle the mass volumes, one of emergency care, two of acute care, and three of long-term care until this build is completed. Uh, the build is great and I think it's the best thing that happened to our cancer unit because we see a lot more people. But the emergency room expansion is going to be 12 beds. Uh, the Northside General has over 10,000 visits a year in its diminished capacity now because there are no physicians. So is keeping these facilities open mean acute care, long-term care, and emergency care? Because right now, emergency care is not happening at our facilities. It's not happening in the Waterford. And in the month of January, February, Glace Bay has a bulk of the times their emergency room was closed. And the regional just can't handle it. It was never designed to handle five hospitals. It was designed to handle two actual acute care facilities and a, a mental health facility at that time. So does be, keeping them open mean all aspects of it, and what are we going to do to keep those emergency rooms operating to take the, the strain off of the emergency room at the regional hospital until that happens? Mr. McDougall. Uh, thanks, Eddie, for your, for your question. Uh, very, very concerning for uh, Cape Breton. Um, we hear comments from uh, patients and families frequently about this, uh, this issue. Um, in relation to keeping those those departments open, um, the emergency department uh, physician resource uh, challenges that we face uh, within Eastern Zone, Cape Breton, provincially, nationally, um, very difficult to uh, correct that within a short time frame. So we, uh, we are working with our colleagues, our physician colleagues in the emergency program of care um, in collaboration with senior executive leadership to see what possible options are available to us to uh, look at uh, what could be possible in relation to North Sydney and Glace Bay in particular. Um, the water for the physicians in that facility in that community uh, resource, the, uh, 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 the emergency center at that site. Uh, fairly well. Um, there are certainly some gaps from, from time to time, uh, month to month. We have uh, looked at additional um, payment schemes in relation to uh, challenging shifts, uh, in relation to different shifts that are, are difficult to cover. So um, the ED program of care, uh, Dr. Milburn, uh, is working with uh, RJ, Dr. RJ McKenzie to uh, see what could be possible in relation to shift incentives for uh, you know, evenings, nights, and weekends um, to help uh, ensure that the resources at the Cape Breton Regional Facility are are um, able to uh, take care of emergencies. Um, to your point about uh, North Sydney and the 10,000 visits they see, similarly in Glace Bay, with the visits that they see there, uh, we know historically that uh, 60 to 70 percent of the visits are, are not emergency in nature. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're they're not uh, those patients do not require care. Um, so it's more of a, how do we ensure they have primary care access. 
Um, so we're, we're looking at a number of different options in relation to what could be possible in, in, in the short term for uh, North Sydney and Glace Bay. Um, we have also uh, put out uh, loca masks, um, and there, you know, there's some challenges with that uh, in relation to gaining uh, licensure through uh, the college. And so we work with the college to try and see if there's the ability to influence uh, a change in relation to how we intake uh, locums to the area. And we've recently just had some locums that worked in North Sydney to provide some coverage. Um, but in, you know, in the short term, it is very challenging, and uh, I'm not going to pretend we have a you know a silver bullet to uh, to correct that. We have put some additional measures in place at the regional facility. Um, we're looking at non-traditional spaces to uh, try and cre create some uh, capacity. So there's some additional uh, beds on uh, some of the units that uh, we moved into uh, over the last number of months to help with that flow. And as um, uh, Minister. Um, Martin had pointed out, you know, the last four months have been very challenging, um, and, and healthcare is is difficult and challenging. It's hard to predict when people require emergency care or urgent care, um, and you know, as she had mentioned, the last couple of months have been difficult, and we've been in some overcapacity situations. But uh, with that being said, the last week has been uh, we've been doing quite well, uh, limited amount of emissions in the Cape Breton Regional Emergency Department, which allowed. Uh, for patient flow to go through the facility and allow for uh, for the appropriate care in the appropriate places. So, uh, don't have a you know a, a quick answer or a quick solution to the current issues, but we are you know working with our partners, our physician colleagues, uh, and leaders within the organizations to uh, try and come up with some solutions in the short term while we work on the Cape Breton Redevelopment Project. Mr. Rural. Thank you, Mr. McDougall. Uh, so, the, so the real concern is you're saying that 60% of the visits to these emergency rooms aren't necessarily emergency room visits. I've been given those stats before. I was told that the acuity of the Northside General when they were talking about reducing the pay that the doctors get at the, when they work in these facilities compared to what they got at the regional, that because they weren't uh, as, as necessary emergency visits, but the percentage of emergency visits is the same in the outlying hospitals as it is at the regional hospital. So that was out the window that acuity was, was different. Um, I've had doctors in my office that have volunteered to work these facilities when they were being closed. And they were told by the people in charge that they weren't going there because the facility was being closed. So we had the opportunity to keep them open. And we as a group, and I take it as a, as a government, as a healthcare authority, as politicians, we're blocking that. And the build the hospital and they will come regime, I hope it works. I've seen the movie Field of Dreams where they build a ball field and the players came to play. But we've got to do something more. But we've got five years before that happens. And we've got nothing right now as a plan to bring these doctors to keep these departments open. They're having difficulty with the north side, or with the regional hospital keeping physicians there at any given time in the emergency room because they're just not there. The fear is with the closures, doctors and healthcare professionals aren't going to apply to these facilities right now and they're having difficulty staffing them. What are we going to do in the meantime to prevent this from happening, to keep people here and to bring them here while we're in the bill phase? Mr. McDougal. So your, your question in relation to, or your point in relation to uh, physicians that have asked or, or, or come forward and said they're willing to uh, work in those, those facilities in the emergency departments as they currently exist, I'm unaware of those individuals that have come forward and, and put that place or that request forward. So if, uh, you know, following this meeting, if you want to identify who those individuals were, we can certainly follow up with them to see if there's the opportunity for them to help support and, and resource the, those, those facilities to support the communities. I know we have the, the nursing staff available, and we've just currently transferred them over to the regional development or the regional center to uh, help with the increased uh, demand on that site. Um, but certainly, if we have physicians that are you know willing to and able to work in those facilities, we can place those nursing staff back in those facilities to ensure that there's care uh, in those communities. Uh, thank you, thank you. That's that's good to know. That's well appreciated. Um, I guess my question to you, Dr. Oral, is. Um, um, You've been put, you, you took this job as, to be a voice, which I understand. You were very vocal about it first, and I know that, and I talked to you since then, and it's because of the voice. If your voice has something to offer that's different than what the go-ahead plan is, will that be accepted by the committee, by the group, by the government? As I know, it, uh, say something like the Northside General, <clears throat> not going to have an emergency room. But they're going to have a collaborative practice type hospital. Will there be an acute care minor injury 
clinic in this facility so that if someone cuts their eye or, or a child has an earache, instead of waiting at the regional for at the time for a real what they call non-emergency care, will there be an acute care facility there with maybe two or three beds that the doctors that work in that facility will be able to staff that on an hourly basis so that not all one person is, uh, um, is taking up their time with that. So it'll be an hour a day or an hour every second day or whatever it might be. And are there going to be any possibility of an acute care bed for someone who just might need observation, say for an overnight or for, uh, that would take that strain off of, because the acute care beds that are on the north side now and the acute care beds that are in, in, uh, in the Waterford, there's not enough facilities at the, North, at the regional hospital to handle those those numbers. Um, and so is there something that might be, uh, with public input or yourself input, if there's something different, will that be accepted and will the, will the committee look at that as something that the community has come forward and it's something to look at? Dr. Oral, and then I believe uh, Mr. Day. So uh, that's very important. Uh, you know, when we talk about a health care center, uh, we have to recognize truly what it is. There's a, an impression that we are just adding on a little clinic like a dental clinic at the Mayflower Mall. These are standalone, world-class facilities that are large that will contain many, many clinics. And yes, the, to reduce the strain on an emergency department in terms of numbers of people, there will be facilities in these healthcare centers that will address the earaches, the wound changes, the IV drugs that have to be administered to uh, patients who are living in their own home. All of those things where people are going to receive the care in the community in which they live. That's a very, very strong benefit of what's being redeveloped. And this will make it much easier for the seniors um, in these communities because they are populations of seniors that live there um, to access care exactly where they live. And it will have the benefit of reducing uh, the need for ambulance drives to a big hospital. It will reduce the amount of uh, um, patients that are waiting to be seen and waiting for examination rooms. Our medical residents, the, the family medicine residents, over half of the medical residents that we train want to do a plus one year in emergency medicine. It's a young man's game. People resign because they get tired or they get burnt out. Uh, so these people are going to train to be emergency room physicians. They welcome the chance to come back to a facility that will allow them to do what they see on television as emergency room physicians. They want to look after the people that are in distress, the people that have heart attacks. They're not interested in seeing someone whose child has a runny nose. They want to do the television emergency medicine stuff. This is kind of the, the setup that's going to take place at a redeveloped emergency at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. So the, the recruitment of that kind of trainee back to Cape Breton is very, very real. Mr. Day, one minute. Thanks for the question, Eddie. Um, you and I have chatted in the past about this sort of stuff. Um, we talk about the collaborative practices and I've talked with the physicians in North Sydney and we talk about these, the access to these next day, same day kind of appointments that, uh, you know, that people don't necessarily need to go to an ER for and how do we do that? Um, so we work with the physicians, so Stephanie Langley, Joan Sala, the physicians on the North side and we're working with them to try and figure out what works best to try and to do to see that population of patient. And it may not be the exact same in North Sydney as it is in the Waterford. So we're working with the physicians in the Waterford, Jen Lang, Peter Littlejohn, Steve Farrell. Um, those physicians are there to say, we have this population that you're currently seeing in your CEC, don't necessarily need an ER visit, what's the best approach to do that? So trying to work with them, you know, maybe it's after hours access in their, in their collaborative practice, maybe it's some sort of a walking clinic, we don't know yet, but we are having those conversations with them because we have identified that those are patients that need, still need to be seen moving forward, but just want to to be seen in an ER. So how do we do that best? Yeah. Order, thank you. We'll now revert to the NDP with Ms. Martin for 13 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Going, somebody mentioned the, uh, the list of people on the, the drawing board, so to speak, um, listed community members, uh, doctors, involved community um, people. I wonder if we could be presented with the list of names that are on these redevelopment committees for each um, site for Nwater for North Sydney. Mr. LaFleche? I was going to say, uh, I think, Mark, do you, do you have the, that info? 
Mr. Lecoutier. Yeah, we can, I can provide that for you. Perfect. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Absolutely. Smart. Yep. Thank you. Uh, uh, going back to do what Dr. Earl talked about, um, you know, the IV antibiotics, those types of things, and hopefully that there would be acute care services, even though we're losing emergency services, um, will these clinics, uh, or you've said that these clinics would include colonos, x-rays, blood work, dialysis, mental health, those types of things. So is the functional planning including um, the specifics that are required for staffing? Mr. Day. I'm very, I feel very popular at this meeting. <laughs> um, as I said, Tammy, in, uh, as we move through the functional process um, and the programming, so the announcement last June came out said nine to 12 months for functional programming. So we're moving that forward. And so, for instance, uh, when we look at DI services in New Waterford, for instance, moving forward, so we've asked the clinical directors for that service and the managers who, who uh, administer that service or provide administration to it. Where do you think the future needs to be for DEI services in the Waterford? So x-ray, ultrasound, you know, what other things need to be there in the future? And what, do you, what staffing model do you need to operationalize to provide that down the road? So that is being a consideration as we move forward through the functional plans. The actual departments are saying, this is what we want, or this is what we need, we think we need to have in the future to provide appropriate services, and this is a staffing that we'll, we, we will need to operationalize to be able to manage that. And now we're doing that for all of our services. So we're doing that for DI, we're doing that for lab collections, we're doing that for physiotherapy, occupational therapy, um, public health, um, primary health care. We're doing it through, we, you know, when we look at our collaboratives, we're looking at for mental health and addictions, we're looking for all the services that we're providing. And so for in North Sydney, for instance, renal dialysis, I mentioned that earlier, is going from eight to 12 chairs. Um, so that's an increase of 50%. So how do we operationalize that? So that's part of the functional plan to say, well, we need X, we have X number of nurses now that provide care for eight patients or for eight chairs. In the future, we're gonna have 12. This is what we're gonna need for staffing for that. Um, endoscopy in North Sydney, you know, we're expanding endoscopy services on the north side. So that's one of the things that, that doesn't get mentioned a whole lot. So we currently have one room. We're increasing the three. going to operate two on a regular basis. What's the, what's the staffing do we need for that to move that forward to make sure we can operationalize that and get that appropriate? So continuing care is another one. So all the services that we're doing and looking at, we are looking at how do we need to operationalize that. And so what are the staffing models for that? And we're not doing that in isolation. We're doing that with all the different members of all the different services, the, the managers, the directors, the senior directors, to make sure that you know we're not saying, well, this is what we want to do, but we haven't talked to the people over here and how they're going to run it. So we want to make sure that we're doing it all together, working together as a group and as, a, as one, whole, one whole health authority. Thank you. Ms. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I believe it was Mr. Jessam or Mr. Ward that talked about the um, timeline for, around the fall when the announcements would come, come out about what's left to do. Um, initially, when the announcement was made in June, um, that would put us at about a year. So I wonder, has this been? A, is this an extension to what you initially thought, or you know, six months to nine months to a year? And will what Mickey just spoke of, will that be included in the final report, Mr. Ward? <clears throat> so earlier I spoke about the timeline for the master planning work, and I talked about the functional program and the master program work. So the uh, Master planning work, we, we had been focusing on, on, a, on a 12 month from uh, the time of the announcement uh, by the Premier. Um, with this being such a complex project, we're looking now at uh, probably late August, early September for the final document to be received. But what you'll notice is our most recent announcement with the uh, regional is certainly part of the master planning work. So as projects become obvious that we can pull them away and start to make some announcements, then we'll go back to, uh, to the government, we'll explain what we think is, uh, is our next steps, and then we'll be asking if we can uh, move forward on various phases. So, you know, the, the uh, two community health centres with the uh, long-term care, those are projects. We also have the Laundry North Sydney, that's another project. We have the redevelopment, the remaining of the redevelopment of the regional. And then at the Glace Bay facility, we have the, we have the redevelopment of the Glace Bay. We have the expansion of the, uh, of the emergency department. So we're, to, we're exploring all those individually. And as we start to see projects that are available prior to the master planning finished, being finished, then we'll start to uh, move forward with and ask government for permission to uh, move forward on them. Mr. Day. 
Yeah. And Tammy, just to elaborate on kind of what I was talking about earlier about the, the services and the facility, when you, think of, when you think of what we're trying to do here, we're trying to do, um, think of one-stop shopping. So one of the best descriptors I give for people, and uh, the people on the team are probably tired of me talking about it, is the Walmart on Spar Road in Sydney. So that's your one-stop shop, you know, you go in, you get everything done. So what we're trying to do is provide the, the one-stop shopping for members of the community. So if you go to your primary care pr practitioner and they're in a collaborative practice, which is in the community health center and they give you a requisition for blood work, you can just walk down the hall and get that blood work done. Whereas if currently now you go see your family physician and they're outside of the hospital um, and you give you that requisition for blood work, you may be less likely to get that blood work done right away because it's another trip for you. So we're looking at trying to collaborate it all together and bring it all together. If you need mental health and addictions counseling, you can do that while going to see your primary care practitioner while you get your blood work done, while you can do go see continuing care for your mother who needs some continuing care supports in the home. So what we're really trying to do is trying to provide you know, one-stop shopping, make it easier for people. I know transportation is an issue that we've talked about. This will also help alleviate that because you won't need to make as many stops as you go forward because you can go to that one facility and get it all. And if your mother's in the long-term care facility and it's attached, that's another bonus as well. So we're really trying to, trying to improve things for North Waterford and North Sydney and make sure that people have the appropriate access to the care that they need uh, moving forward not only now but for my kids who live in the community 20, 25 years down the road. Ms. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and that's a good segue into uh, my next question. And while I appreciate all of this information, and believe me that I, I do realize it's going to be wonderful, but I will continue to advocate for what we're doing now and for the lack of services that we have or don't have now and the fact that people are dying now. Um, but going forward with um, long-term care, you know, my, my opinion is that we can't make enough long-term care beds because that's part of the backlog and part of the a huge issue why, why your loved one is in a home in Tanamagush and you live in Sydney. Um, you know, and, and hopefully that at the end of the day when we have all of these in place, um, that won't be the case anymore. But there's currently long-term care beds in New Waterford, North Sydney, and an ALC unit in Glace Bay. So of the new build, the, in, the announced beds that are, are expected, how many of them are actually new beds? Because we know um, that we already have those in place. So how many, truthfully, new beds are coming that we don't have between those three facilities already? Mr. Day. Um, so, Tammy, if you know North Sydney, um, North Sydney has uh, Tysalas, which has 22 beds. Um, then we also have 4 East, which has 14 beds as well. So it gives you a total of 36. Mm -hmm. um, we're adding 60 on the north side. The original announcement was for 48. Um, that has since been increased to 60, which, uh, which I think is a great addition. So it'll provide us you know, 24 new beds on that side based on those, those two units that are currently there. Um, in the Waterford, we have the 24 beds in the Waterford Heights. Um, so in addition to that, we're adding that 60 in that community. That gives us an additional 36 in that community, right? So that provides us some leeway also to help out um, okay. with some of our ideas as moving and not trying to decant, you know, patients that are tying up hospital beds, acute care beds, which are much more expensive. It gives us that opportunity to decant them into long-term care facilities where they need to be. Um, and they can provide, get the appropriate care and the appropriate level of care um, that they need. So. We really are, you know, the 48 announcement uh, was fantastic in June. That has been increased to 60, which is only a greater benefit. Um, will allow us to offset what's currently in those two long-term care facilities in those hospitals, those community hospitals, and then allow us to decant other members who are also on a wait list in the community or also tying up an acute care bed, which goes back to the ER backlog as well. And it's all a bed flow issue, right? So ER gets tied up because we don't have acute inpatient beds because they're tied up with long-term care patients. That's one of the reasons. So if we can get those long-term care patients into a long-term care facility where they need to be, provide more appropriate care for them, it frees up acute care beds, which also gets our ER patients who are admitted and waiting in ER for an acute care bed and gets them moved out of ER and up into, into a bed, more appropriate. So it basically provides a better flow and more appropriate care to patients all throughout the health system. Ms. Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So is, is, does that mean then that there are 60 new beds, not anywhere yet, because we do know that there's ALC patients in Four North in Glace Bay, so I, I don't know where they're going, but, I, and as well as how many that, you know, we could uh, canvas today that are in, in an acute care bed right now that's taking up a bed. So is it 60 new beds? 
Mr. Day. Yeah, so overall, so we have the 24 I talked about in Waterford, mm -hmm. so that's in addition to what's currently on 4 North, uh, or sorry, on um, Tysalos and on 4 East, because uh, that's 36. If you want to count the 4 North in from the Waterford, uh, from Glace Bay as well, so you have 24 and 18. Um, that gives you your 34, your 42, gives you another 18 there, so you're adding in those 20 to depart from the Waterford and North Sydney. So that is that it still provides us enough of what other acute patients would be or long-term care patients and acute beds to offload that for sure. So, and that was one of the objectives was, was making sure that we had that ability. Um, I don't think you're, you know, you could provide all kinds of long-term care beds and you could always find somebody to, 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 to fulfill them, but we also need to provide other services to those members. If we can find enhanced community services and those sorts of things as we hopefully we'll identify as we move this forward, that may be additional supports that we can provide as well, so. Ms. McClellan. Just to confirm that um, with the 60 additional beds in Northside and uh, North Sydney, it'd be a total of... No Waterford. I'm sorry, New Waterford, it'd be a total of 74 net new beds. Mr. LaFleche. I just want to point out those figures are what's part of this project. So there may be other things done in CBRM or nearby, which are not part of this project in terms of long-term care. So that's the minimum you would see. Ms. Martin, one minute. So to be clear then, we're not including those patients that are already in an acute care bed that should be in a long-term care bed in CBRM. Mr. Day? Um, that's, a, that's a hard number to calculate on a regular basis because that number fluctuates so much. For sure. So currently right now, as Brett alluded to earlier, um, the regional hospital bed situation is very good. Um, at certain times of the season, or t part of the year, you know, we do reach max capacity and we are, fulfill we are full at that point in time. Um, but right now, you know, we have very few ALC patients in the current facility and there's been a lot of work done with that over the last number of years to try and reduce that number on a regular basis. So it's not as huge of a number as it used to be. Thank you. Time's expired. We'll now uh, turn to the Liberal Party. Mr. McClellan. Uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, I think this uh, question would be for Dr. Oral. Maybe there might be something to add for Brett and Mickey. But um, again, obviously, you, with this, uh, the significance of this investment and uh, what we've seen at the regional, uh, the two new sites in the north side in Waterford, and of course the expansion in Glace Bay. Um, as I said uh, in, in my previous uh, in the previous round, uh, people are extremely supportive, and, and um, I think they know and feel uh, that this will be the difference maker. Uh, no question in terms of, of getting to that uh, getting to a place of stability uh, where the services, the recruit, they are, are right sized and, and uh, properly aligned uh, and where the recruitment and retention uh, aspects of, of what the, the department and the health authority do and the, and the, the medical uh, community in Cape Breton do, um, you know, will be maximized. Um, the two things that I hear in terms of, and it was uh, touched on before, the two things that I hear uh, in response to this, as much as people are, are incredibly supportive, uh, number one is that uh, based on, I guess, the history of, of uh, political promises, uh, from all parties and in all jurisdictions in, in the world, um, they're not sure if it's actually going to happen to this magnitude. So I think that as we roll out plans and, and, and um, you know, really shore up those details, uh, people are becoming uh, very confident that these all of these things are going to happen to the tune of half a billion dollars at these four sites. And, and I obviously have no doubt this is, these are a done deal, we just have to get there. Uh, and I think that's the, the, the part of my question as, as this... Um, this, the, the capital unfolds uh, and the infrastructure begins, uh, becomes to, to into fruition and, and, and gets built. Um, there is that that's that space, uh, and with the, with the strain and with the pressures now uh, on our current complement, um, my read. And again, uh, this is just uh, as an outsider. I'm certainly not uh, inside the medical community, but I, I listen to a lot of people and and talk to, to doctors and healthcare professionals. Um, when we're talking about recru recruiting, retention, and all the all the functions that go into that, um, the medical community themselves, the, the men and women who do this every day, uh, have a significant role to play. Uh, so when it is about recruiting in other jurisdictions, and it's about sort of you know making sure that th those that we have here retain, I think. Uh, 
docs and, and medical professionals lean on each other. Um, so would that be in the case, uh, Dr. Earl, this is probably more anecdotally than scientific, but um, what is the reaction uh, from uh, your colleagues uh, in terms of both the, 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 the physical infrastructure and the plan that's in place? Uh, is it sort of widespread support? Are there, is there um, pockets of, of concern about what the plan uh, rolled out is? And I think that speaks to, to MLA Mamberkat's consultation question. Uh, and secondly, how, how will it affect recruiting and retention in terms of the way in which we, we hold the line between now and to the days uh, to the day when the, the doors are open on the new facilities, Dr. Rohr. The the day that I it was announced that I had received uh, or I was successful in, in uh, acquiring this position, I had almost the entire medical staff text me or call me because they were very, very encouraged that somebody local was going to be involved and they were very, very supportive. That based on my interests and the things that I had done in the past, as well as my experience in working there for 30 years, that uh, things would happen that would be very agreeable to them as practicing uh, internists, uh, family practice uh, uh, people and surgeons. Um, I've since heard from a number of the specialties that we don't often consider, the radiologists, the pathologists, and, and everybody that has a thought, um, you know, about how to make this even better is very, very quick to, to liaison and to, to uh, um, um, express themselves, which I'm very encouraged about. The, um, the, the ability to attract people comes as a, a double-edged sword, if you will. Uh, if you're struggling for facility, some specialists will say, I'd love to have another colleague, but I don't want to divide up what I have now in terms of being able to offer my service and to practice my specialty. This redevelopment will take some of that concern away. If there is uh, space, if there's a redesign uh, that will consolidate care that will use resources efficiently, then they are much more interested. Our best recruiters are our own physicians and surgeons, and they will be much more interested in uh, um, approaching uh, new grads, new trainees uh, to come because they know that there won't be a significant impact on their own ability to practice when they attract new people. So this is very, very progressive. Thank you. Mr. McClellan. Uh, thanks for that, Dr. Earl. And just before I uh, uh, turn it over to my, my uh, colleague, uh, MLA Mamberkat, I just want to say something. This is a statement, uh, not a question, so I just want you to think about it. I think that for all of this, the entire plan was very comprehensive and a major spend uh, to actually work properly. You're going to have to do the Glace Bay project first. <laughs> and with that, I'll turn it over to MLA Mamberkat. <laughs> Mr. Mamberkat. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Mr. McClellan. I, I just want to go back to, uh, how much time do we have, Mr. Chair? You have approximately eight minutes. Okay, um, so so I want to go back, to, and it's been talked a bit about um, uh, through these proceedings, uh, and it's something that's come up in the community a lot, and, and you know, as community members, regardless of where we live, um, you know, facilities have been built by our families, they've been built by community organizations, um, they've been built by uh, service clubs, etc. They're part of our fabric and it's always very difficult uh, when you make changes where facilities uh, will close that are older and you're looking at new facilities and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of a process that goes through that when you look at it we heard a bit of, about it today uh, in regards to some of the challenges with some of the older infrastructure I remember St. Reed's Hospital and the shipyard I'm a shipyard guy from Sydney and St. Reed has meant the you know meant the world to the community but eventually closed for newer facilities and and, and some people uh, found that at the time they were they were sad about that but that was the reality of the situation, uh, that hospital closed uh, for the regional. Um, so, you know, we're in a situation now at home where, where these buildings mean a lot. They mean a lot to these communities. They've been built uh, by community members. Uh, we've heard that passion from my colleagues on on, uh, on all sides of the floor in regards to that, that, you know, the facility... Uh, 
you know, and, and the Waterford was built by the community. The facility on the north side was built by the by the community, and and uh, these are the, 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 there's a lot of attachment to uh, to these facilities. Um, so there's the emotional side of this, of course, uh, the community ownership of it, and and then there's the infrastructure pieces as well. We know our cancer center. Uh, you know, has you know the, the patients coming in have doubled, and uh, that the capacity wasn't there. We know that uh, that our, our ER at the at the regional as well was uh, not a capacity. So we need to make some changes. So, so the point I'm getting to is, is if you could elaborate on on some of those challenges that you looked at uh, when you were making the decisions. Ultimately, we've made decisions to move forward with newer facilities. Um, can you elaborate a bit on some of the challenges that you faced uh, when you were actually Doing the assessment of those uh, those those current properties that we that we have now, Mr. Lafleche. The two people who who accompanied uh, some external consultants on those assessments are Brian Ward and Brian Darrell. I know that Brian Ward talked earlier, so maybe Brian Darrell, you could talk a little bit about the assessments and what you found up there. And Brian has been familiar with these facilities because he's taken care of it as an employee of the Department of Health or TIR for many years. And he, in fact, is working uh, on the first part of the project, which is, in fact, the dialysis unit at Glace Bay. Um, uh, so that is, Minister McClellan, at the front end of the project. <laughs> uh, Brian, do you want to say a few words on the trips you made up there and what you found? Yes. Mr. Darrell. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to actually address this, because this is an area that has bothered me a long time. I've spent a lot of time in those facilities, and I see the passion that the people who work there have for those facilities. They, in many cases, are almost in love with the buildings, and you, they take great pride in it. And it comes as a hard thing when they actually have to say that, um, you know, maybe it has reached the end of its life. You um, walk in and you see the facilities where um, you just cannot ex put any more equipment in that space between the floor and the, between the ceiling and the, f the floor above it. You just cannot fit any more. And the standards in our new hospitals are such that the air changes on an hourly basis um, just cannot be carried by the pipes that are there. You see the existing um, um, pipes that are in place, you know, soil, um, soil pipes, the copper tubing that need to be replaced. And you're saying, you know, to knock the hole in the wall, to put this in, it's going to, the cost is just going to be astronomical. You look at the washrooms where you cannot actually get a wheelchair into the washroom because they were designed in a different era. These are things that, you know, to try and renovate them to actually um, build them to accommodate our current standards, you're not doing the people there any kind of justice or service. It's almost better that you say, you know, we've reached the end of our lifetime. Everything has a, a cycle and those facilities just have. Mr. Mummerkett. Yeah, thank you, and Liz, and thanks for your work on that because that's that's a very difficult conversation uh, to have. Because as I've said, you know these these buildings um, they they mean a lot to uh, to our communities. They've been established for a long time, and as I've said, they've been they've been constructed and, and loved and cared for by the communities uh, where they exist. Um, I guess uh, a follow-up to that um, is is the cancer center, and and we talk, you know, and you know we have world-class care at home, and and we all have family members that have gone uh, through or know uh, someone who has uh, experienced, uh, you know, the, the amazing um, uh, service that they receive in Cape Breton. So this was a big part for all of us was the expansion of the cancer center because we knew it was needed. Um, in the community. So, um, Dr. Earl, I guess I, I would pass it off to you if, if you want to just elaborate a bit about what this is going to mean for cancer care uh, at home for, for Cape Renters. Mr. Bo Dr. Bond. I'm sorry, <laughs> Dr. Oral. Well, I, I'm going to refer uh, perhaps to Mickey as well to address this, but uh, I, I can say that for many years, uh, uh, a large part of the reputation of Cape Breton Healthcare has centered around the care that 
Cape Breton who's received at the Cancer Center. Uh, an enormously devoted group of people, well-educated and uh, very modern. They're, they're communicating uh, uh, with protocols and, uh, and other cancer centers all around the world. And uh, this facility has really been a very renowned facility for treatment of Cape Bretoners. Uh, and my hat's off to the people that have worked there. Um, like anything else, it was designed at a time and has become antiquated in terms of the space. They look after far more patients, twice the number of patients that it was intended for. As well, and again, it met the standards of the day, but uh, this is very, very um, sensitive area for treatment. Uh, the facility doesn't lend itself to the privacy, to the um, special needs of families and relatives and caregivers and support people, and to the axillary, axillary care that, that people need. And uh, this has to, um, uh, to change, and this redevelopment will do that in the expanded cancer center that's going to be, uh, be uh, created. Thank you all very much. We have 10 seconds left. Uh, Mr. LaFleche. Uh, Earlier there was an indirect question of uh, how much physician or stakeholder input really there was, and I think the Cancer Centre is a good example, uh, together with the one in Halifax, where the, the physicians themselves, the practitioners, had a significant input in changing the direction of what we were going to do. Uh, so what you, you saw announced for the Cancer Centre a couple of weeks ago was a significant augmentation and, and, and difference from what we originally announced in June. And that was mainly due to the, uh, the input of the professionals. Thank you. Time has expired for questions. We'll now ask if there's any closing comments. Mr. LaFleche. Yeah, just a general uh, closing comment that, uh, and I think it's been alluded to, this is a, a really exciting project that people want to join. Uh, uh, Dr. Oral uh, indicated that he applied for, for the position and was uh, very happy to get it. I think everybody here, um, many of them applied for their positions and they viewed it as a, an opportunity of a lifetime to work on this project and the QE2 project. I can tell you that all across Canada, the interest we're having from people to work on these projects uh, is very exciting for us. And uh, we're very privileged and uh, happy to work on them. We're going to do the very best we can as a group. We're working together as an integrated team, ourselves, the health authority uh, staff, and the Department of Health and, uh, and uh, uh, wellness staff, as well as internal services on the procurement side and the IT side. And uh, we have an example here. We, we're, we're proud to, to have an example of a team that works across different departments and different Crown agencies to deliver something very good on behalf of uh, Nova Scotia citizens. Thank so you. with that, I'll terminate my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Oral. As, as I stated, I, I feel very privileged to uh, be working um, on this project. I feel enormously grateful to the team that I joined in January. Uh, Paula Bond has uh, provided exceptional leadership and has taught me a great deal about leadership in the short time that we've spent together. And Mark and Mickey, Brett, I've had the highest respect for them. I've worked with them for many, many years in other capacities. And uh, I guess as the senior guy, I'm extremely um, proud of the fact that they've uh, uh, become such uh, important leaders, as are the, uh, the other members of the team. Uh, this is a legacy issue for us. This is something where we are going to do it correctly and we are going to make sure that the delivery of health care for Cape Bretoners will be as excellent as it can possibly be and uh, we'll feel very proud of leaving this kind of legacy when we're uh, finished. Thank you. And uh, personally, I'd like to thank all of you very much for being here today. It was an extremely informative session uh, and on a personal note, uh, Mr. LaFleche, thank you for being here today also in, in light of the circumstances. Appreciate it. You don't get to talk again. <laughs> we'll, uh, you can be excused now. We have, some, uh, we have some committee business to deal with. And again, thank you very much.
So uh, we do have one uh, uh, order of business for the March, uh, I'm sorry, not the March, the May 14th meeting. Um, the QE2 redevelopment, um, we've, uh, we are going to have a motion, I believe, to have a delegate change in response to um, uh, Dr. Craig Beaton, Mr. Craig Beaton, Ms. Suzanne Lonescroft. Uh, yes. Um, in light of the Deputy Minister's not being available for our May 14th meeting, I would like to make a motion. I move that for the May 14th meeting on the QE2 redevelopment topic, we substitute Craig Beaton with the Department of Health and Wellness for the Deputy Minister. Mr. Beaton is, is the best fit for this topic and can pr provide the necessary information to the committee on this very important topic. No discussion. All those in favor say aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. So our next meeting is scheduled for May the 4th from 1 till 3, but May 14th, I'm sorry, from 1 to 3, but if the House is still sitting, we're going to be meeting, uh, just put you on notice, from 9 to 11, and that will be Department of Health and Wellness, um, Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal, the QE2 redevelopment. Thank you all very much. We're now adjourned. <laughs>